Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Alex Smith. I'm the chair for this first session. Um, there is some has been some technical problems already. Um, can you send the new link to the presenters? That's yeah. Um, and I think we are back where we were supposed to be. Um, this morning, the first, we'll just get straight into it. We have Arthur Richards, who was talking this morning again, and he's going to be talking about uh, drones mostly. Um, so I'll just go straight over to Arthur if you're ready to go. Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. So uh, drones, teams, and minds of their own. I'm going to be talking to you about autonomous uh, mobile robot systems. Um, so this is a quick trip through three different collaborative projects. Um, uh, so the first one is, is what we call drone automation. So this is part of the Cascade uh, program, which is an EPSRC program grant led by Southampton, in collaboration with Imperial Manchester and uh, Cranfield. Um, and lots of different case studies in this, lots of different themes in this, but we're looking at only pilot operation in um, structural surveying. And, and essentially, it's can one person turn up and survey a bridge uh, without having to shut that bridge? Um, the trick to this is to try and make sure that that person, the pilot, is able to keep their head up. So we don't want that person having to be looking at screens, um, figuring out drone states and batteries and waypoint numbers and heaven knows what else. What we want that person to be doing is keeping their eyes up, watching the drone, watching out for pedestrians and traffic, and watching out for passing police helicopters and, and weather changes and things like this. So focusing on piloting as a task. Um, so we're going to automate the rest. Uh, and we've really enjoyed a collaboration with Clifton Suspension Bridge in this as well. So uh, they've been great. To, so the, uh, Trish at the bridge describes them as a as a learning bridge. Um, and they've been uh, helped great at, at both letting us actually go and fly at the bridge, which is a, a, an exciting and terrifying prospect in itself. Um, but also helping us understand, well, what does what does what do they really need? And what is the use case? Uh, because it's not always what people in the drone world like myself would first think. Um, so the outcome ends up looking like this. So actually, it's surprisingly clockwork. So I'll talk at the end about autonomy, and this is almost probably not. You know, you can you can argue whether this is not it or not. But um, uh, but essentially, we pre-design the mission, and then you end up with something that's all, frankly almost like your washing machine, in that it kind of steps through the stages of it in an intelligent manner. Um, but that that makes it much easier to. Um, for a pilot to be able to understand what's going on. So the pilot can have a picture in the head about where the drone's going next, and it either goes there or it doesn't, or it jumps off to its safety point and waits for them uh, for things to improve. Um, so the system is relatively simple. We have a thing, so um, you know, the, for us, we put the, uh, the automation in the ground station. You could probably put it in the drone as well but with what we've ended up with. Um, but, um, and, and it's actually implemented as a little bit of game AI called a behavior tree that gives us a really nice modular solution to being able to de design this sequencing. Um, and, uh, and a nice offshot is what you end up with. This is a really simple uh, finite state transition model, which is very, very amenable um, to formal verification and to study of its safety. So we've got something that's really quite simple, but quite powerful and, and focused on safety. Next project I want to talk to you about is wireless drone networks. So this is in collaboration with Toshiba's Bristol uh, Research and Innovation Lab, or BRIL. Um, you'll be hearing more of those later on. So this is one part of our um, collaboration with them. But uh, Sabine Howard, who turns up later in this talk, will doubtless say more. Um, so this is a, an individual PhD, and it's looking at the interplay between uh, swarms of drones and the communications that would be needed to support them. Um, so the starting point for this is, well, drone teams is relatively obvious, but our, our big bit is making what we call reliability aware, and I'll, I'll describe that in a moment. Um, and then what we'll be moving into is, is exploiting a new communication capability that Toshiba are, are working up um, to manage the health of a drone swarm. Um, so I, I'm going to express this with a problem statement. It's quite a small swarm, but but you know just you know run with it. Um, so supposing you've got three drones and you've got an aircraft to scan, which is a, a relatively complex shape, and these things do need inspecting. People do things like you know driving ladders into them and heaven knows what else. So every so often they just need a bit of a look over. Um, and your task is to survey it, and you've got ten minutes to do the job before somebody needs the aircraft to go off and do something else, or someone else is going to come into this space, so you can't fly drones anymore. So this is a fairly typical problem statement. Um, but what you'll find in research is there's a lot of people who told me like, yeah, you know, the, the best thing you can do for that is you can get it all done with three drones in seven minutes. Um, and with all due respect, that's not the problem I've got because I'm using multiple drones because drones, you know, they're going to have problems. Maybe the battery didn't charge as much as it needed to. Maybe they got a bit of turbulence around the back end at one point and I didn't get the pictures I need. So drones fail. And that's why we have more than one. 
And so the positioning here is to change the problem statement and say, okay, I've got 10 minutes. What do I do with those 10 minutes that maximizes the probability that I get this job done? So it's a different way of framing the problem. Um, of course, you know, as, as an academic, I love it as a way of framing the problem because it's a really hard way of framing the problem. It turns out that it's a really challenging optimization. Um, it's one of the nasty MP hard ones that doesn't scale well at all. Um, but happily, PhD student Mickey has found various approaches to solving it. Um, and it turns out it's all about managing the overlap. You've got to be, you, you know, these, if we're going to be reliable here, we've got to have the drones overlapping sometimes in what they do. Um, but you've got to manage that overlap very carefully to achieve good reliability. Liability. And you can get some great improvements in your probability of getting the job done uh, with these approaches. Final collaboration I want to talk to you about is the Tales Bristol Partnership in Hybrid Autonomous Systems Engineering, uh, which is a mouthful, so I'll call it TB Phase. Um, this is a prosperity partnership. So Elaine, like Cascade, it's a, it's a really big program, um, you know, big team over five years. Um, and it's a joint investment, um, half from Tales UK and a half from EPSRC. Um, and it's enabled us to build a really uh, an integrated team. So we have Bristol and, and Tales researchers working together. Um, and the problems they're working on, um, so what is this hybrid autonomous systems engineering? Well, hybrid means it's an environment that's open. Um, so it's not bounded, it's not carefully controlled, it's got wind, it's got rain, it's got people, it's got uncertainty. Um, and the human element of this we really bring out as well because we're interested in how, you know, how humans as part of these systems will, will engage with them. Um, and we know, you know that, that sometimes these things can just be really badly and we want to make sure they're done well so that humans know, you know humans have a good experience of, of working with, with these systems. They're autonomous in the sense that you know, they're powered by all sorts of weird and wonderful things like artificial intelligence and they have emergent behavior um, and you know, they may be artificial evolution, there may be reinforcement learning. So lots and lots of the kind of things that we know from research are incredibly powerful but make systems very, very difficult to predict. Um, to predict their behavior. And then the systems engineering part of this, it says, well, okay, we, we need to have confidence that these systems are going to behave in good ways, in acceptable ways, and that they're not gonna do anything disastrous. So the, the mission of Tales is to do safety critical systems. That's what they're all about. Um, and so that requires us to kind of come up with a new blend of these things that we can, that we can have that confidence. Uh, findings so far, um, and I'll, I'll breeze through these as fascinating. So here's a bunch of agents who are doing um, a, a frightfully clever um, coordination algorithm called multidemic evolution of tasking. So this means that when they get together, they can swap ideas and have a little evolution algorithm about who's going to be doing uh, which task. Um, and uh, and they're, they're, they're just flying around the world trying to trying to do jobs as they uh, as they come in. Um, so uh, key findings in a, in a system sense of this. So for starters, we tried to use reinforcement learning for this um, and we're not stupid. So it's not like we didn't know what we were doing, but at the same time, we found that actually reinforcement as a, as a technology, you know, you'll see some very, very slick examples in the world that says, oh yeah, you know, with reinforcement learning, we can do this, this, and this. Those have been very carefully managed and reinforcement learning is just not an easy technology to get going. And if you've got a, if you've got a good idea of what the answer is, then you can start, but it's very heavily influenced by your setup of the problem. Bizarrely, noise is extremely beneficial in this case. Now, of course, you never get rid of noise anyway, but there's a pathology in problems like this, which is that if the agents start to have the same idea about what's going on in the world, they just end up doing the same thing. And at that point, well, what's the point in having more than one if they're just chasing each other around? So noise kind of shakes the whole system up a bit and breaks down those pathologies. So we found that slightly counterintuitive finding by experiment. Um, and then finally, which is is that, you know, I mean, here is what we like to think as an example of a relatively clever algorithm. We've got lots more of those. Um, but in some ways, some, some problems are just not that hard. And so if you imagine that this world is just simply strewn with tasks, then it's very hard for you to move without doing something useful and being on top of a task. Um, and so actually the advantage of the of, of clever algorithms diminishes as the problem changes. Um, and so understanding those transitions is, is part of ongoing work. Um, I've also talked about sort of human elements. So here's another example of that. And again, Sabine will talk more about swarming later on, but here's a swarm of agents who are simply tasked to, to buzz around this world and um, and turn essentially search it and, and turn the, the red dots green. Um, 
so there are different behaviors that they can switch between in the swarm here. So you can say everyone spread out or everyone move in a particular direction. Um, and those are being chosen in this case by uh, an evolved supervisor, which is a, an artificial piece of code uh, that's been developed by PhD student Elliot. And, um, and so it's selecting the behaviors uh, using a very coarse view of the world. So we're looking down and we can see everything, but the, the supervisor is actually only able to see the center of mass of the agents and, and roughly how spread out they are. Um, and it turns out that you, know, you can't do things like forming teams here because these things don't have bit switches on the side of them that say you're agent six, you're agent 12. They're just they're completely blind to their identities. That's kind of the way you've got to be when you scale up like this. Um, and so you have to be clever about how you choose it. So what you see in this example is that basically it, it sort of chops them in half by moving them across a certain wall. Um, and that's its way of forming a group, which is incredibly hard to do otherwise without saying, mm, OK, you know, 1 to 12, you're in this group, and 13 to 24, you're in another group. So, so it's quite clever how this has come out. We're now moving into, um, into trials of this. Um, with real supervisors to understand how it works. We have very different mechanisms for that. This could be a sort of assistant for the human. It could be a kind of insight for the human to just say, we think these are the most likely buttons you're going to use. So all of that work is ongoing. And a quick trot through some other findings from TB phase, uh, network topology versus consensus. So uh, Mike croscombe has been looking at how um, different, you know, different forms of networks between the same team of agents um, can actually end up having radical changes and how well they're able to find a, a combined view of the world when their individual measurements have errors. Uh, Chris Bennett's been looking at saying, well, okay, what about, what about if these agents are all different? Um, and we've asked a very basic question about that. Is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? And the answer is, it depends. So, uh, and, and so that's something that it's an important finding that it's, there's no simple answer to does heterogeneity make things good or bad? Um, and so that's opened up a, a further line of work for investigation now. And finally, so I, I, you know, it's a big team. We've got lots of people of, of different disciplines in it. So the psychologists in the team have been asking about how sense of agency, which is an important metric, which kind of I won't try and define because it sort of is what it sounds, um, and how that's affected by workload and level of automation. Um, and it turns out that you can measure sense of agency through various proxy measurements. Um, uh, and, and so you'll see from a, a quick note, the answer is it makes a big difference. And so that's motivating lots of questions about, well, how do you, how do you get the right match of, of that feeling of that sense of agency between what's actually going on in the system and, and how the supervisor is interacting with it? I couldn't resist but close with a question on what is autonomy. I know everyone groans at this, but I, I think it's something really important to flag. In, um, in the industrial setting, um, autonomy is all about flexibility of action. So if you have an autonomous car, for example, and you talk to an engineer about it, then they will interpret that to mean you program in a destination and then you can fall asleep. That's not legal, by the way, but in one day it might be. Um, but you know, if you if you genuinely had an autonomous car, it would be interpreted as you can fall asleep in the back, and uh, it will get you either to your goal or as close as it can safely, subject to whatever's going on with it. So so you know, and that'll be true for a wide variety of conditions, but. Um, but that's you know that's that's its reason for being is to get you where you want to go. If you talk to medics or philosophers about what it means, they're suddenly terrified about this, and you realize that they interpret it means that the freedom of the goal itself. That's what autonomy means in those settings. That those systems can choose to completely ignore the external input. In the same way, for example, that you're entitled to ignore the medical advice and direct your own treatment if you find yourself unwell. Um, so, and it's, I, I just think it's really important to flag that when we talk to different communities about these things, different people are hearing us in different ways. And that's one of the big challenges that we must remain mindful of in this uh, setting. So um, thanks to all the uh, students and staff and collaborators who are listed. Not, not everyone, I couldn't get them all on here, but the people who've, who've essentially whose graphs I've stolen. Um, and there's links to more information in my email address there. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Arthur. Um, we uh, have a comment section on the YouTube video if anyone wants to ask any questions, and we can answer those as we go if you, anyone is interested. Um, I will now go on to Mark. Uh, do you have your slides, Mark? And uh, Mark, we're we talking about smart automation for SMEs. Right. Oh. 
Right. Can you see that all right, Alex? Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Corduroy, and I'm uh, the entrepreneur in residence at uh, the University of West of England at the Brit uh, Bristol Robotics Laboratory. And um, what I want to talk to you today is a slight different, um, maybe a slight change of track. I want to look at how automation is relevant to SMEs because we've all seen the uh, rows of robots sitting in large production facilities, building cars, washing machines um and things like that and it's you know when i talk to people about um automation and startups and uh, um enterprise it's not uncommon to get the phrase you know automation's been done i i see it regularly you know whenever there's a story on uh you know the bbc we have a photograph uh like this on display um and yet the reality is automation is only really used at scale by companies with mass production type problems, people who build cars and washing machines um, and food manufacturers. There is a huge part of the economy that isn't using automation at the moment. And I think that's a real challenge both for, for the economy and for those organizations. And the reason for that is um, if you look at the makeup of our economy, um, and I'm talking about the UK private sector here, approximately 60% of companies employ less than 250 people. They only account for about 50% of the uh, gross domestic product of the country. And it sort of indicates that the small organizations are not being as productive as large organizations. And if small organizations don't adopt um, the technologies of automation, um, they're going to, there's going to be a, a productivity gap that develops between um, uh, the small organization and the large organization. And actually that affects both of those organizations because the supply chain of a large enterprise is made up of small enterprises. Some supply chains might be as high as sort of 80% uh, small organizations um, creating that supply chain. And so if small organizations aren't embracing automation and the productivity gains um that it uh promises uh the large automation the large organizations are also capped in their ambitions and this is a real problem um the the two quotes on this slide are from the royal statistical society and the institute of government where they're basically saying um you know productivity has flatlined um in our economy for nearly 10 years um we've had probably the lowest productivity growth since um, in the 20th century. Um, and that that just reinforces this need to uh, approach how we execute business and how we plan business uh, differently. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I'm not gonna sort of labor it because I actually think that there's another um, way of looking at this, but for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this was an idea um, developed in uh, about 2011 when the uh, German government were looking at how they wanted to uh, stimulate their economies. Um, it was the keynote at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2016. And it was basically um, this idea that we've moved from um, earlier industrial periods, which had different types of technologies that drove their economies, whether it was uh, uh, mechanization and steam power or mass production and electricity or computers and automation. We're now moving into this new era where um, it's about how do you connect the real world with the virtual world? How do you um, uh, create new opportunities for connectivity decision making? But in this definition I found for this area, it still talks about the ongoing automation of traditional manufacturing. And to me, that still says that um, the people who envisaged the fourth industrial revolution were still looking at that original constituency that uses automation. And what I'd like to do is try and look at this through a different lens, um, because I think it gives an insight into the opportunities for companies of all sizes, but particularly um, small companies who, um, whether they're a startup or whether they're an existing business, um, there is a an, an opportunity through um, what has developed over the last 50 or 60 years. So I've created this sort of timeline of 
four streams of technology. So we start off with traditional automation. Um, you know, the first robot arm was deployed 60 years ago by uh, General Motors. And during the last 60 years, we've seen a host of de technology developed that has become commonplace, very reliable, very robust. And this is the technology that's driving those um, large automation systems you see. So we, you know, we, and you know, 2015, the cobot arrived and there is a progression. Um, but one of the main things about traditional automation, it is being framed by the market it serves, which tends to be uh, the large uh, uh, company. In parallel to the stream, um, we have the information technology stream, which um, basically was born after the uh, automation uh, stream. It was born in the sort of the, the launch of Intel's first microprocessor in 1970, the IBM PC in the early 80s. We are all used to information technology as a productivity tool through the use of laptops and Wi-Fi and smartphones. It's a, you know, this is the stream that is the first device you touch at the start of the day and the last device you touch at the end of the day. Um, but the, the, the key thing about this technology stream is that it has transformed um, the economics of technology. The production of smartphones in their billions, the rollout of different types of networks and communications have created technologies that the rest of us are able to use. So the cloud technology stream is, this is really sort of, um, I call billionaires row at the moment. These are all the companies that have sort of used cloud technology uh, to change how businesses operate. But this is change in a digital sense. So the World Wide Web was created 30 years ago, 30 years after the first robot arm was put into production. And that cloud infrastructure has enabled a host of um, new organizations to uh, be created that automate operations within a business, whether or not whether that's automating how you manage your customer customer information or manage your um, e-commerce channels, um, right through to the latest um, organizations, the uh, robotic process automation companies, RPA companies, UiPath and Blue Prism, who are looking to automate digital processes within organizations. And just the whole idea of them being termed robotic process automation is a, a market confusion, you know, uh, where does the word robot sit? Is it, is it it's something that sits in, in the digital world or is it something that sits in the physical world? So there's one other um, channel which is even newer than the other three channels which I um, uh, just want to touch upon. And this is um, the latest new technology. Um, I put AI in here from 2000 onwards, um, AI as a, research area has been around for many decades prior to that but really it was only the arrival of huge amounts of computing power and huge amounts of data from platforms like google and things like that that has finally made ai and machine learning um, uh, a tangible product that can be now uh, used by businesses then we have um, the latest generations of sensors you know we're in the world of passive sensors that can last for sort of many years on battery power in some areas, um, the internet of things, all those connected sensors. And we're moving into new types of devices, AR headsets, new types of connectivity, which are gonna change how people can interact with, within their own business and within the, the physical and uh, the, the digital world. And these technology streams are really starting to converge now, and they've converged to a point that Gartner have coined um, a new term of hyper automation, um, which is this idea that um, hyper automation is that movement that will connect everything to anything. So um, everything that should be automated will eventually be automated. and Gartner see this as one of their top technology trends for 2021. Um, and it's beginning to change how organizations look at deploying uh, automation. Because actually, if you embrace the idea of hyper automation, what you're actually doing is you're, you're, you're 
acknowledging that the automation problem isn't a silo. Um, it's not a tablet on the side of a cobot. It's not a program sitting in the cloud. What you have to be able to do if you're going to really get um, uh, automation to work for organizations is to be able to work across these areas. So work with information in the cloud, whether it's an AI model, whether it's a, a business process, work with computing devices at the edge, which might be a vision system. It might be augmented reality um, hardware. Um, but it's also about reading data from physical sensors and controlling sensors. And uh, we're moving into a world where more and more of what we purchase as individuals and businesses will be automated and controlled and monitored. Um, so when you get that new central heating boiler, it may well have sensors in it that are able to detect the um, the the type of you know how hard the water is. It may be able to detect when faults are being being able to happen, and it will be able to change maybe parameters about thermostat settings or burner settings, so it can actually make sure that that boiler doesn't break down, but it gives you an, a, a notification that a service is required, or maybe it will allow for variable servicing distance uh, intervals depending upon what type of uh, water and uh, usage uh, that unit uh, has. So what hyper automation does do is it says automation isn't one thing, it's lots of different things. But I think it's important to look at what are the barriers to companies adopting automation, um, because if you can fix those barriers um, or remove those barriers while delivering the, the promise of uh, hyper automation, you start to move into an area where more and more organizations can benefit from uh, uh, this new technology. The three most common uh, barriers won't be a surprise to anyone in this space. Firstly, it's cost. Secondly, it's the complexity of programming and the fact that every arm you buy or every device you buy is programmed in a different way and there is a lack of integrators who understand a company's specific problems um, and i think that's an important uh, barrier because the system integrator community um, has developed over that that 60 years that uh, traditional automation has been around to service that traditional market they tend to work with large projects um with uh organizations that are looking for long-term engagements, they don't tend to look at the lower end of the market. And if you look at the other end of the market, the low cost automation, um, the marketplace is being transformed. Um, and I've just put a few images of some of the products that are being rolled out at the moment. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi on the top left is now uh, available on a chip for you to integrate into your own systems, 74p per chip. Um, the clear core controller, um, I'm working with a company at the moment that's using this to control vaccine programs. It's uh, an industrial controller running at 24 volts, opti optically isolated. It can control server motors and stepper motors, um, PWM feeds, host of control, it costs about 90 pounds. Um, companies like IGUS are beginning to develop low cost robots um, uh, that are, to say they're good enough for most tasks is not trying to downplay the, you know, how clever they are, but they, they recognize that um, there is a whole scope of different um, capabilities required by industry. So the, the IGUS Delta robot here, it costs seven thousand pounds. You know, some of the admittedly bigger and faster Delta robots, you're talking 120, 140 thousand pounds from traditional suppliers, and they are similarly rolling out this philosophy into Cartesian robots, into different types of grippers. There are camera companies now bringing out really powerful cameras. In fact, I was talking to a supplier um, last week that has a camera and a knowledge base of 3,000 different sample containers used in the pathology lab, which is now available as an off-the-shelf product. And similarly with end effectors, you know, 
the world is getting um, easy, it's getting far easier to sort of put together systems um, to meet the needs of uh, different types of organizations. So what do we need to do to move forward? And I think this is where the BRL um, you know, has a big role to play uh, and it has been playing this role for a number of years. I think one of the things SMEs have to be encouraged to do is to engage with places like the BRL, engage with um, the suppliers that are out there and try and identify specific processes that need to be automated. There's that phrase, you know, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. You know, it's, you don't have to, um, just because traditional automation have built factories around robotic lines, that doesn't have to be the way smaller companies benefit from this technology. I was speaking to a, a European car um, manufacturer um, recently, and they've just started to adopt um, RPA, robotic process automation for digital tasks. And when they started out, they thought they'd just be automating maybe half a dozen key tasks. I think they were targeting HR originally. And I think over the course of two years, they're, they're up to something like 800 robotic process automated tasks now. And by starting small and seeing what the technology could do, they've been able to roll out time and time again, um, automated software solutions that save them time and money. So there are a whole, whole set of sort of environments where automation can be really quite accessible from monitoring, inspection. Um, automating people is something, you know, um, is you, you sort of have to sort of uh, hesitate a little bit. But by, what I mean by automating people is how can technology make people do their jobs more efficiently? Uh, give them the information they need, send the right person to the right machine to fix it when it goes uh, something goes wrong. Um, I think there needs to be more standard solutions created. I think the current marketplace automation has been very much a project-based uh, activity. And uh, you can see in maybe the laboratory sector where they've got uh, off-the-shelf pipetting machines now, they've started to embrace this. And... Um, the cloud has become far more accessible and it means that you are able to integrate solutions and data feeds and, and use them throughout your business. Um, and I think the cloud providers, people like Microsoft with their Azure product, Amazon with AWS, they are making much of this uh, uh, technology, whether it's uh, uh, image recognition systems or uh, speech to text systems or um, uh, even real-time control systems, they're making that far more accessible. And I'm working now with a number of companies in the uh, BRL incubator where we're looking at uh, uh, no-code type application platforms, which will make it easier for people to um, uh, control, automate, and uh, if you like, command uh, uh, automation processes. So, that's all I've got to say in this session. Later on today, there are two related sessions. Um, there's a panel to set, uh, session at 1.30 with um, Open Bionics, Indus, and the RIF um, discussing uh, smart automation for startups. And then at three o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have a look at uh, the ecosystem that we've created uh, for startups within the university. Hi, Mark. Thanks for that very much. Thanks very much. Um, if anyone is there, we have, I know we have a few people watching live at the moment. You can ask some questions in the comments and we'll be able to respond to them. Um, if you want to watch this session again later or any of the other sessions, they will be on the BRL events page and uh, you can switch between them and add comments and we will be able to come, be able to come back and comment back on things if you're interested. Um, so I think we'll, we can stay online for five minutes or so. And then there is a short break. And then uh, the second sessions will start at 11 o'clock. So in this track, we'll have Alan Winfield starting uh, talking about robot accident investigation. Uh, and then Sabine Howard uh, talking about swarm solutions for intralogistics. And then uh, robot vision talk with uh, 
uh, Mellon and, and Smith later. So uh, we'll stay online. Um, if any comments come up, we'll we can respond to them. So we do have a question from Rafael Santi. How do you make sure you create a common programming platform that is being wildly used rather than becoming just another, yes, another way of programming a robot? It's a good question. Yeah, um, and I think that goes right to the heart of separating out, um, if you like, the different layers of functionality that um, uh, need to exist in this type of environment. There is no point in trying to re-engineer the code needed to control a robot like this um every i think there's over you know just in the cobot world there's probably 60 manufacturers they all program their robots in a different way um and what you have to do and uh, what what is increasingly being investigated is this idea of uh, event-driven messaging systems which enable um robot controllers to be told what to do and you can create those controllers in a way or those messages in a way where they are um, from the control platform point of view they're they're arm agnostic so um you could you could you could control a lifeboat using this technology by sending it a certain type of message with a certain type of payload that the crew of that lifeboat understood how to um, execute and you can use that same idea when you're trying to control a robot or trying to read a sensor um, and then you graft onto top of that the the, the business logic of um, uh, of sort of, of processes, you know your your if then type statements and your uh, your switches and uh, your logical operations. Um, it is a challenge. Though. I mean, th this this is why it hasn't been done. Um, most people who are using no code environments tend to do it in quite a fixed domain like RPA. Um, where they tend to be working with digital information. Um, and you know one of the challenges of hyper or, um, automation is that you are working with devices that are at the edge, that devices that are in the cloud and physical devices. And to add another layer of complexity, you're you're dealing with devices that may not be always connected. They might be, you know when a lorry drives through a tunnel, it might lose um, internet connectivity. Um, so you've got to build in, uh, the uh, algorithms and the the buffers required to have things that drop offline, and the, the the devices at the edge have to know how to respond at the edge when they lose connectivity. Yeah, and I'd just like to add to that as well. There is um, for anyone that's not familiar, there is uh, something called the robot operating system, ROS, which uh, was a research thing for a really long time, and the idea was to uh, standardize um, robot communication so you can sort of have it robot agnostic and they are working more with industry now so there's Ross Industrial and there's Ross 2 which is much more real-time communication and uh, much more solid so there, there is there are things going on but there isn't necessarily uh, an agreement throughout industry really uh, we have a couple more questions uh, Naya Bamad, is there a platform for different service companies in the UK that are working to provide services for hyper automation for SMEs? How can we find such companies if we want to work for them? Um, there isn't a platform as such. I mean, this is uh, this is still a world of uh, predominantly early stage startups um, in the same way that it's happened in lots of different spaces from you know Shopify doing it for e-commerce sites and Squarespace doing it for websites you know, there are companies now working on doing this um, uh, my contact details are available um, off the BRL website and I can put people in contact with companies who I know are working in this space um, and you know what's interesting is that the even some quite small startups working in this space are working with some very large, you know, we're talking about multi-billion uh, euro turnover businesses because 
the large organizations realize that um, sometimes they've got to step outside their own uh, comfort zone and sort of have their thoughts challenged by an, you know, an organization that you know, doesn't play by the rules that they've, they've, they've helped create for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we have time for one more question uh, from Rhys Davis. Can you point to any case studies or real world examples of where SMEs have dealt this issue and adopted automation tools? I'm interested in learning what tools that already exist or popular. Um, I would say, yeah, yes, is a simple answer, but I mean, probably the best place for you to go to is go and listen to uh, uh, Riff, who are at 1.30 uh, in their panel discussion. Um, uh, Farad, um, who runs the Riff, has worked with probably over 200 um, SMEs over the last, I don't know how many years, but you know, his, his organization within the BRL has specifically been set up to work with SMEs and help deliver automation solutions. So I know that they, I think in fact, Farad might be doing a talk later this morning on robotic cameras and and how that was worked in sort of natural uh, film, na natural uh, history programming. I know he's worked with um, companies that have built vacuum cleaners and he's built, you know, um, he's working with uh, companies, sometimes it's quite mundane, working out how to take something out of a box. You know, the automation industry is very good at putting things into boxes. It's not always very good at taking things out of boxes. And so I would say that Farad and the Riff are, are experts in that area. Yeah, I've, uh, I've added a link to the Riff Bristol website if you want to learn more. And I am going to stop the stream here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks for the questions. Thanks, Mark, for talking. And thanks, thanks Arthur. Arthur, for talking. Uh, we will be back on a different uh, streaming link, which you should be able to find from the, uh, the information you were given before. So I will catch you at 11. Thanks, guys. Thanks.